I think there's a handout going round, um, and I'm also a Lowlander, and I have to say that uh, I've, I, I really came to Gaelic poetry and, and Gal the Gaelic language um, through um, my interest, actually, in Sonny McLean. I think I'm not the only one who has had that experience. Um, you'll notice that the, the handout, I've only included the, um, the English translation because that's obviously what you're going to be looking at um, with your students in, in class. Um, but you just, you never know when um, you start teaching um, poetry, even if it is in translation, um, what seed um, you might be sowing in, in people that they might eventually uh, go on to, to learn a language and, and maybe read it in its, um, in its original form. So um, it's kind of a, 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 double, um, a double job, really. But on, on hearing that the Gaelic poet Sorla Maclean's poetry had uh, been chosen um, as key text for um, how I was elated. Um, this is a poet's work, and I'm biased, obviously, but this is a poet's work who should be heard and studied by more people. And I hope that today I can make a case for that. Looking at the poems which have been chosen as the key texts, uh, Halig, Scrapedal, An Autumn Day, I Gave You a Mortality, Shores and Heroes, I was struck by their passion, their courage at tackling both highly political and highly personal themes and their technical prowess. The simple fact is that Sorrel McLean is, I think, the perfect poet for pupils, students studying for hires to engage with. He was a young man, not long out of his teens actually, when he composed many of his most famous poems. And that was actually one of the reasons why on the, in the 2011 book we were very keen to get a, a picture of him as a young man, um, rather than as the, sort of the old sage that we, we've kind of come to know. Um, he was passionate about politics and had formed many of his most strident and impassioned political ideals while still at school at Portree. He fell in love with a woman, unknown to her, but procrastinated over it and the love remained unrequited. He grew up during a time of threat of war and political upheaval. Political passion, feelings of unrequited love, knowledge that the world is changing and is unstable. These are all experiences and situations that are well understood by young people today. So I think they do have relevance, um, even if m much of the poetry we're going to look at is, is firmly based in the 1940s onwards. Sorrel Maclean is also synonymous with 20th century Gaelic poetry. He's viewed as a spokesperson and a tradition bearer of his Gaelic culture. And yet, at the same time, you will often hear people proclaim that Maclean's poetry is not Gaelic, but European poetry, emphasising how Maclean's work somehow rises beyond and transcends the tradition from which it originated. It's, it's interesting that you don't tend to, to describe um, English uh, poets in the same way, you know, it's just, it's just a given. Um, but I think this is something that tends to happen um, in relation to 20th century Gaelic poetry. So is Maclean a Gaelic or European poet? I think the answer is both and um, rather than either or approach. But the fact that Maclean has been interpreted in so many ways highlights a tension that arguably stems from his own work. There's a dichotomy in his poetry, an opposition of themes, and the reason I think this comes so naturally to him is that these same factors played out in his own life. As a Gael in the 20th century, Maclean existed in what we'd probably describe a between, as a between place. Maclean was born in 1911 in Razi. Um, he was one of a family of seven. And it might do no harm in emphasising um, to your students the social situation of uh, the time. Many of his life decisions were made out of economic necessity in order to help his younger siblings through their education. From an early age, he was greatly influenced by the Gaelic tradition. His family was steeped in the old Gaelic songs, so Maclean was always aware of this aspect of his native culture. It may also be worth noting to, to future students um, in working on Maclean that the other great native influence on this poet was his landscape. A bit like uh, George Mackay Brown as well. So the, the Maclean family's embracing of um, Gaelic song was slightly at odds with the other great tradition of his island, and that was the Free Presbyterian Church. So while Maclean rejected the Free Church um, in his poetry, um, 
he embraced the gospel of socialism as he himself put it. And I think it's interesting that he actually describes it as a gospel. He never quite um, gets away from, uh, from, from that wording. He studied honours English language and literature, gaining a first class at the University of Edinburgh. And if his early life had been characterised by the Gaelic oral tradition, his university days opened him up to modernist literature and also afforded him the opportunity of meeting Scottish writers and intellectuals in Edinburgh, including Hugh McDermott. Maclean went to Murray House and from there began a career in teaching. Much later, in 1956, he moved to Plockton in West Ross and was headmaster at the high school there until his retirement in 1972. Now, obviously, I'm preaching to the converted uh, with this particular audience today, but I think it's important to take into consideration Maclean's passion and dedication to his profession. In many ways, he was a teacher more than he was a poet. It's no coincidence that his poetic output was not abundant during his teaching years. But the love of his Gaelic language and culture, which is so obvious in his poetry, translated into his teaching too. He was a campaigner for the teaching of Gaelic in schools and the Gaelic paper. And he was also a supporter and advisor in the early days of the Gaelic college, um, Solmer Austin and Skye. He retired in 1972 to the Brays district of Skye. Um, and it's interesting that after his retirement, he takes on another role um, as, as the sort of voice of, of Gaelic uh, poetry um, after that time, a time when, when Gaelic poetry was, was having a bit of a revival, a renaissance. And he actually uh, took part in poetry tours in Britain and Ireland and beyond. And he was awarded honorary degrees from seven universities. He died in 1996, but his poetry continues to influence and act as a benchmark for a new generation of Gaelic poets. Now, I want to mostly concentrate on the, the key texts uh, today because that's uh, obviously what you're going to be looking at um, with students in class. Um, and it's possible to identify, I think, several Sorla Maclean's in these poems. It's perhaps the reason why these texts work so well as a sample of his works. When I looked, when, when we worked out what the, the texts were going to be and I looked at them, I, I, could, I could see certain threads um, working their way through all of these. They show clearly the breadth and depth of um, Maclean's poetry. So we have the sorely the war poet in An Autumn Day and Heroes. We have the love poet in I Gave You Immortality and Shores. And we have the Gallic tradition bearer and voice of the people, and I think he took that very seriously actually, in Halig and Scrapadal. I'm not for one minute insinuating that Maclean's poetry can be so easily categorised as this, um, or only performs one function at a time, but it is useful to bear in mind these different poetic roles because I think um, Sorley as a poet also was aware of these roles. So let's begin with the war poems. Um, as a bit of background context here, I should say that while English poetry often seems to lack uh, World War II poems, I've heard that from many people in comparison to the number of World War I poems composed by a number of writers, Gaelic does not have the same dearth. Maclean composed a number of World War II poems and also referred more fleetingly or subtly to the war in a good few other poems as well. I've mentioned already Maclean's dedication to the socialist cause. He wished to fight on the, on the Republican side during the Spanish Civil War and was only prevented from doing so because of economic reasons relating to his family. He described himself as a communist and was a supporter of the Red Army and the Soviet Union, a stance that caused him some difficulty and embarrassment later when Stalin's atrocities came to public attention. He was fiercely critical of all forms of capitalism and in letters to friends in particular we really get the sense that he viewed the concept of Great Britain as abhorrent. In fact you can, you can nearly taste the distaste that he has for it in his letters and yet he joined the British Army at the outbreak of World War II. This very action seems out of character given that a number of his friends and fellow writers were political objectors. However, his reasons for joining the army were completely logical in relation to his personal, moral and philosophical belief system. Firstly, he viewed himself as a man of action. Secondly, Maclean's 
main reason for fighting in the British Army was that it was the only way that he could see to take a firm stance against fascism, something which he hated above all else. So he compromised on certain beliefs and ideals because he was not prepared to watch, as he put it, fascism poison Europe. This quandary is something which could definitely be emphasised to any student of Maclean because um, it's what gives his poetry, I think, its tension and its richness. But he does not become mindless in his army service. Um, Heroes and an autumn day prove that point. Maclean trained at Catterick Camp in Yorkshire and then was posted to North Africa as part of the Signal Corps. And he was actually wounded um, while in service in November of 1942, recovering in military hospital and eventually being discharged in August of 1943. And both the key text uh, war poems deal with his experiences on active service. But you'll notice that they have an underlying message as well, which hints at um, his socialist ideals. As he himself noted in one of his war letters, he was not a pure recruit. So in an autumn day, uh, Maclean recounts his experience of being shelled and having to stay put for the whole duration of um, that autumn day in this hole, surrounded by six dead comrades. And in some ways, this is a perfectly formed, uh, personal, almost journalistic account of war experience. The noise, uh, the shells talking about my ears. And in, later st- and in a later stanza, the other sensory experiences of battle, he writes, when the screech came out of the sun, blinding of eyes, splitting of hearing. The shock of the dead bodies beside him cannot be underestimated. The repetition of six dead men at my shoulder on an autumn day at the end of the poem is a neat device, showing that the poet seems to have to repeat his memory of this one more time in the poem to come to terms with it, or even believe what he has felt and seen. For a Gallic poet who is almost at who is most at home describing his native landscapes, the beauty and unforgiving nature of the desert is a surprising contrast and this poem proves that Maclean is not just a landscape poet of the familiar but of the unfamiliar also. The relentlessness of the sun, he describes it so white and painful, both slows time and heralds the passing of time from morning to midday to evening. It's only when the stars come out and darkness falls in the desert that the reader is given the impression that Maclean is able to make his escape. But having had the whole day with these dead men, he has had time to think of the greater subjects of destiny and fate. And I've already d- mentioned that Maclean had rejected his free Presbyterianism, but it's interesting that he uses the language of the free church to process the deaths of these men. One election took them and did not take me without asking us which was better or worse. The election, God's choosing of individuals unto salvation, manages to tie the, for the foreignness of the desert back into a more Gallic sense of the world. But the election is also undermined in the poem. It is as devilishly indifferent as the shells, not the way the election is supposed to work at all, but with its emphasis on, with its emphasis on choosing and predestination. In the first stanza of the poem, the dead men are described as waiting for a message, presumably one that did not come, again undermining the definition of the election. So is Maclean destabilising church philosophy or simply showing, in the best way he can, his utter depression and helplessness of the meaninglessness of war? I think he's doing both here. Certainly he continues this destabilising in heroes, But this time, it's in relation to Gaelic poetical and cultural ideals and themes rather than religion. In the poem, Maclean describes the death of an English soldier. He describes him as a poor little chap with chubby cheeks who fought bravely but was killed in a distinctly unheroic and unromantic way. Now, to understand heroes, we need to first understand the context of the tradition from which it arose. The description of heroism in older Gallic poetry from previous centuries usually referred to the chief or other heroic member of a clan and followed a strict code of praise which included always describing the hero as superior in appearance and highly accomplished in deeds. 
His genealogy would be well known and the act of naming was an important device in this context. And that's something that I always, you know, try and um, really make clear to students that this name, if you look at any Gallic um, poem from the 17th, 18th century, this, this constant naming uh, comes through. But this doesn't happen in Heroes um, because the the title of the poem is Heroes, the plural succeeding in removing the personal emphasis on a known hero. Maclean's hero is an unnamed English private, as far removed from a Highland chief as you can get. And the third stanza reiterates this point. He was not a hit in the pub in the time of the fists being closed. The reference in these lines is to an older Gaelic praise poem to Alan MacDonald of Kingsborough and Skye. And this is what I love about Maclean, that you, you have these little pockets of, of information within the poems, little doors that you can kind of open and go down into other centuries. So, um, but he takes that, he takes that um, idea, but he injects his war poetry with a realism more suited to the horror of modern warfare than to his own Gallic tradition. So he's subverting the traditional devices of praise um, that would be so well known to a, to a Gallic audience. Um, and I think that's proof actually that Maclean had not lost his communist or socialist ideals in the army. He continued uh, to, to sort of hammer that point home. He would rather praise a nameless English soldier than the um, higher members of his own society and he's under no illusion that these soldiers of World War II are expendable. The soldier who died a sad and quite ugly death would gain, in his words, no posthumous medal. He was instead one of the masses so close to Maclean's heart. When he writes that he took a little weeping to my eyes, he is echoing the concluding lines of the elegy for Alistair of Glengarry, composed by Sheilas Nekiepi around 1720, but is aligning this older Gallic praise poem to the modern, more collective sense of death he was witnessing in the desert on a daily basis in 1942. Now, while Maclean is rightly well known as a war and political poet, he's perhaps even better known as a love poet. And this reputa re reputation stems almost wholly from his 1943 collection of love poems, uh, Dan de Aver, Poems to Aver. And this collection of 60 odd poems created great excitement in the Gallic world. People talk about that they can remember where they were when they first opened um, this collection um, up. Um, and it's the book that probably best describes a, an ushering in of a clear modernist sensibility uh, to Gallic poetry. So it's a real landmark in Gallic literature. The poems are addressed to Aver, the name of the Irish hero Cuchulain's wife. But Aver is really a symbol of three or four women who were in Maclean's life during his early adulthood. Incidentally, incidentally, sorry, two of the Maclean key texts, Shores and I Gave You a Mortality, are poems from Dan de Aver. And I could talk for half an hour on poems to Aver um, on their own, but obviously I'm going to keep, um, keep it brief today. But if you're teaching these poems, some context of the greater story arc of these poems might be, might be useful. Yes, they can be standalone uh, poems, but their power also comes from the fact that they are part of a greater whole. The two main Avers, um, who have been given the most attention over the years, are a red-haired uh, Irish woman who Maclean met in Edinburgh and who was researching the National Library of Scotland, and overlapping in some places a yellow-haired Scottish uh, woman who is thought to have been a musician. And I mention the hair colour uh, because not only is it an important Gallic motif um, through uh, poetry in the centuries, which Maclean reuses in a modern setting, it's also a very handy way to differentiate which Aver figure Maclean is addressing. It's not always as simple as that, but it's, it's quite useful. So how do the, these key texts, um, Shores and I Gave You a Mortality, fit into the sequence? Well, Shores comes quite late in the sequence. In this poem, the poet and his beloved appear on five different beaches, uh, Talisker in Skye, Calgary in Mull, Hofstra in Uist, Moidert and Mull Stenshul Staffen. And in a way, this roll call of beaches, this naming, again, this idea of naming comes into it, which has a beauty of its own, is as much a love poem to these places as it is a love poem to a woman. <laughs> 
The poet wishes to defend their love against the ravages of time. The beaches could be interpreted as being liminal spaces, between land and water, yes, but also between the present and eternity. And it's also, I, I should say, one of the, the only poems that I see coming up again and again in, um, in books about weddings, you know, readings for weddings, because it's one of the few poems that Sorley composed. It's actually sort of just romantic without too much pessimism <laughs> in it. So um, anyway, the final lines are apocalyptic in imagery and like many of Maclean's references, relate to oral history and culture, thereby tying his own love poetry into a much greater tradition. He writes, and if we were on Mall Stenchel Staffen, when the unhappy surging sea dragged the boulders and threw them over us, I would build the rampart wall against an alien eternity grinding its teeth. Mall is a, is a beach of shingle, um, thus Mall Stenchel Staffen is the shingle be at Staffen in Sky and the Rassi hero, you know, again we get this lovely um, sort of melting pot of history and culture and language and place names with him um, with Sorley. Um, the Rassi hero Ian Garav was supposedly shipwrecked and drowned off this beach around 1671 and the story goes that the boulders were thrown up on the beach the day he died so in other words the very landscape was coming out in sympathy due to the death of this man. Um, Maclean takes this story and reinterprets it in light of his love for the Aver figure. The boulders that are spat onto the beach are imagined in relation to the ocean throwing pebbles or stones at the lovers. It's a hostile force, but the poet assures his love that nothing will come between them. The same theme of eternity is explored in I Gave You Immortality, but in this poem, Maclean's tone is quite different. This is a poem which structurally most resembles a Gaelic song meter and yet it also has hints of the influence of Shakespeare and the metaphysical poets. I Gave You Immortality is about Maclean's self-consciousness about being a poet. What power lies here, for example? How, what, what can he do with this vocation? And it's also a settling of scores or a balancing of accounts in the poet's own mind towards his beloved. I gave you immortality, and what did you give me? In stanza two, Maclean acknowledges that the deal is reciprocal. Again, that's quite a Gallic idea, the, the, uh, the idea of um, a reciprocal relationship between the clan and the, and the chief or the poet and the, and the people. But here it's, um, it's used in, in the sense of love. Um, if I gave you immortality, you gave it to me. You put an edge on my spirit and radiance in my song. Later still, Maclean appears to imagine himself taking his place within the Gallic literary canon. So it's, it's quite a self-conscious poem. <laughs> but if I reach my place, the high wood of the men of song, you are the fire of my lyric. You made a poet of me through sorrow. In the last stanza, the poet is clear that while physical beauty can rot away, as well as the apparently trivial matter of his love marrying another, um, the poetry that he creates about this beauty will be lasting. The poet's relationship to his love transcends time and physicality and this says a great deal about the respect the poet um, affords his tradition and also indicates that while Poems to Aver appears to be a sequence of poems about a poet caught in turmoil of uh, passion, there is an underlying steeliness, a greater sense of the po poetry's purpose and direction. Maclean is working again on many levels here. Now, I've left um, Halig and Scrapadil uh, to the end of uh, my talk today, again, because you could talk for half an hour on, on Halig alone, um, but mainly because they come later in chronological uh, terms. Halig's probably one of Maclean's best known poems. For those wishing to provide a, a more multi-dimensional approach to, to Halig for their students, it might be worth mentioning that the late Martin Bennett uh, set this poem with Maclean reading it uh, himself to music on his seminal album, Bothy Culture. And I know a lot of young people actually who have come to know Maclean's work through this medium. It's, it's really surprising the amount of first year students that I have at university who can recite all of that poem quite simply because they've sort of almost gone clubbing to Martin Bennett's music and you know they, they've, um, they've heard it so many times that Sorley's voice has, has gone in that way really. Um, 
Halleck's a township on the island of uh, Razi, and in 1846, the island was purchased by George Rainey, a man we'll meet again uh, in Scrapedal. And he was the son of a Highland minister and from a notable Highland family. And 14 townships, including Halleck, were cleared by Rainey. Thus, on one level, Halleck is a poem about the Highland clearances from the perspective of a 20th century Gaelic poet. Halley begins with the line, and it's a very famous line, Time the deer is in the wood of Halleck. And this one line hints at the theme of the whole poem and also introduces the poem's symbolic style. Um, time is a living entity, it's the deer, um, which exists in Halleck and in the poet's own consciousness. The window is nailed and boarded through which I saw the west. This evocative line sees the poet introduce a window into the soul of the gales and their experience of loss and desolation. However, this is at its heart a nature poem and the rest of the poem is set outside of this window. And my love is at the barn of Halleck, a birch tree, and she has always been between Inver and Milk Hollow. Again, you've got these this constant um, naming of, of places. The birch tree is known to be one of the first species of trees to repopulate a destroyed area. It's the symbol of recovery and regeneration in the poem. And in the poem, the descendants of those who lived in Halleck are described as trees. Their daughters and their sons are a wood going up beside the stream. So Halleck is not populated by people, but by trees. In one sense, this is a profoundly depressing picture of nature claiming ground where people once were. However, Maclean's vision is also redemptive. The older panegyric poetry of the medieval Gallic bardic tradition often used trees and other vegetal imagery to describe the strength and nobility of the chief of a clan. And in equating the people with trees in Halleck, Maclean is modernising and um, modernising this image and making a democracy of sorts. He's, he's making a collective hope for the future of the regrowth and resurgence of a Gallic community. And in the final um, stanza, which is pure symbolism, a vehement bullet will come from the gun of love and will strike the deer that goes dizzily, sniffing at the grass-grown ruined homes. His eye will freeze in the wood. His blood will not be traced while I live. When teaching students this poem, I would encourage them to think in terms of what Maclean has created as a poet here. Who is holding the gun of love? Well, who's in control of the whole poem but the poet himself? If he is the one who brings down the deer, who we have been told at the start of the poem represents time itself, then what we have here is the poet stopping time. By stopping time and ending the linear movement of history, Maclean is in control. He succeeds in preserving his sense of place and what Halleck means to him and to his people. The gun, with all its connotations of violence, and obviously Maclean in both the Gallic tradition and in his war poetry isn't a stranger to violence, um, but he takes this gun and instead it's an embodiment of love in this poem. For all the hopelessness of the clearances in the past, Maclean has succeeded in capturing a moment in eternity which will last at least as long as he does. And I think we can safely say that Halleck's gone beyond that. Um, Halley carries on the themes of I gave you immortality regarding the role of the poet and his power. But Halleck, I think, is a surrealist, community-driven poem compared to the personal immortalisation of one woman in his poems to Aver. Now, Scrapedo, and this is the last poem, uh, could, be dis could be viewed as a companion to Halleck, although it can still stand very much on its own. And while Halleck attempts to make sense of the clearances and retain some hope in the face of loss, Scrapedal is slightly more pessimistic in its look at the future rather than the eternal past, rather than the eternal present. But I think Scrapedal is probably a poem that a lot of students um, at present will really identify with because this poem shows that while still embedded in the Highland landscape, uh, landscape Scrapedal is another village in Razi. Maclean can still engage with global politics, dealing, as the poem does, with the risk of nuclear holocaust. In the poem, Maclean comes to terms with the fact that the damage done by the great pietist 
Rainey in relation to the clearances cannot come close to the devastation that could come about by nuclear submarines passing through the Sound of Rasi in the 1970s. The death that would bring utter devastation even on the beauty that grew in Scrapadil. The insinuation here is that while the people of Rasi were lost due to Rainey's clearances, the landscape remained untouched. This would not be the case with a nuclear threat and thus this possibility takes on a meaning beyond Maclean's imagining. While the trees can remain to repopulate Halleg, there is no such hope offered to the reader of Scrapadil. So it's quite a, a depressing poem to, to finish on, but I just today I, I realised, actually listening to speakers this morning, how many sort of linking factors we have um, of environmentalism, worry about the future, um, war, um, love, all of these things um, feed into Maclean's poetry too. So in conclusion, we've swept across quite a good chunk of 20th century history with these poems from World War II right up to the ever-present worry of nuclear power. Um, these key texts are a great chance, I think, to, sh to show school uh, students not only a window into Gaelic culture, some might be familiar with that uh, culture, others maybe less so, but also a glimpse of how one mind makes sense of political and personal struggle. And this universali universality, whether the poems are being taught in their original Gaelic or, in this case, in their English translation, is the most important thing, I think, that can be taken from them. So thank you very much. Gone quiet with the <laughs> with so <laughs> quickly. <laughs> yeah, the um, the good thing about McLean is that he translated most of the work, uh, most of his work himself, um, and I think all of, thankfully, all of the key texts uh, have his own uh, translations. But for the 2011 book, um, which we really worked hard to bring out for his centenary year, there were some poems that he hadn't translated uh, before and. Christopher White and I did the translations for, for those ones, but um, that that was very rare. Most of most of them he provided English for, and I think I think that kind of says a lot actually about um, the period that kind of Sorley was um, writing, composing work in, because he was very aware, um, at least at later on, certainly in the 70s when we had this kind of Gaelic Renaissance, that um, a lot of people were coming to his poetry. Um, as non-Gallic speakers, so those translations were really important and I think have kind of taken on sometimes a life of their own, so, okay, thanks. I think it's possibly worth pointing out that the Shores and I Gave You Immortality are also translated by Ian Craig. Yes, yeah. Somebody else's. Yeah, and actually, I prefer. I think I prefer Ian Crank Smith's um, translation of Shores because it gives the um, it gives the place names, but it it gives them in um, almost the meaning behind them as well. So Sorley was always quite literal. I think he deliberately did that, you know, to show that they were translations. But Ian Crank Smiths are fantastic. So I, I gave you immortality. <laughs>